Welcome to EduView on the EdReach Network with show number 24 in our second season. We feature a panel of experts with a purpose to professionally and critically discuss and assess the current trends and topics in education and technology. Tonight, we have most of our regular panelists, including Amy. Welcome back. Hey, and uh, we also hey. have, for just a little bit, Stacia. She's out and about in Atlanta tonight. <laughs> But she wanted to stop in, so we appreciate it, Stacia. Thank you very much. And tonight we will be talking about an amazing topic, what not to do in educational technology. But before we start, we want to remind you that you can find EduView on YouTube, iTunes, and the EdReach Network, where all our shows are available. We'd love to be a more frequent presence in your ear, especially if you can't make our live shows. Mm, which is always a bummer, but keep in mind that we love our back channels on G Plus and on Twitter. And remember on Twitter, it's hashtag EduView, E D U V U E. Make sure that you send your questions or comments in for us, and uh, we will definitely get back to you the best we can. I'm sure Kat will. I ran this one week. I did a horrible job at QA, but Kat will do a wonderful job <laughs> at getting back to you through the back channel and on QA on our Google Plus event page. So make sure that you chime in there and let us know what you're thinking because we know you have ideas too. I forgot to enable Q&A. Oh. <laughs> well, I enabled it one week and then didn't answer any questions, so... It's hard to remember. It's a little hard. It's very hard. Consciously, like, click on it and find it and try to keep up with it and then interject the Q&A during the conversation, which, you know, we all tend to be verbose, so... <laughs> which is not a bad thing. Not a bad thing at all. Not a bad thing. No. So, as always, we're going to start with a couple hot topics. Um, Jamie, I know you have one. Yes, I'm really excited for my hot topic tonight. Um, I was going to hold out, but I got a little tweet happy earlier. And um, so, as of today, well, not really as of today, but it's live today. As of today, um, I am a... Um, I'm a blogger for Horace Mann, and so I'm going to be um, blogging twice a month for them, and I'm very excited. I'm going to share my screen. Um... I got a little screen share and happy there for a second. Let's screen share for real, maybe. Click and screen share. Did you disable that, too, Kat? <laughs> <laughs> I'm clicking screen share. And no, I have, no, I have not. Happen. Y'all see anything happen? It just mm -hmm. it highlights screen share and it sits there. Screen now, share. Before the show, you were messing around with your displays. I was messing around with my displays, but I'd like to blame Google instead. Well, perhaps. Perhaps it is Google. You know what? There's always a backup plan. Here's the backup plan. I'm going to tweet out the link. <laughs> um, it's a, If you have not heard of it, it's reacheverychild.com. And um, I actually wrote a blog that was actually inspired in Voxer, not on our Voxer, um, but with my Voxer, that's my Texas slash Canada um, Voxer. And one day Greg Garner said, um, why do we put the word digital in front of everything? And what, what, where is it needed? In, in 21st century, where we are today, after 20-some years of the Internet, why are we still putting the word digital in front of everything? Why is it digital citizenship? Why is it digital literacy? Why is it digital? Why are we not saying citizenship and literacy? And so we had this really great discussion on um, Voxer about where the word digital should still be needed and then where the reality was that in some cases we're still not making some, there's no breakaways, really. And so that inspired that blog, which is, Citizenship with a digital twist, which is the concepts that I wanted to highlight. That we've taught did, we've taught citizenship in the, our classrooms every day. We still continue every day to teach them not to plagiarize. We still teach them to recognize when someone's being hurt or mistreated. We teach them to be kind to each other. We teach them to you know be honest and do the right thing and look out for one another. And the the digital piece of that is simply we're just looking at a different platform. We shouldn't be afraid of teaching digital citizenship because we think that word changes what it is. It doesn't change it at all. It's still the premise of citizenship. And so I'll tweet that out. Um, and that'll be uh, you know twice a week or twice a month blogging for them. And I'm really excited about that. Um, it's just a really neat thing to have you know someone reach out to you and and you know enjoy what you write and then be able to share with the you know with their readers. And then hopefully I can share with you some of their other bloggers that you know maybe you haven't actually read any of their stuff before. So I'm excited to be blogging and, um, and posting that a couple times a month. Yay! That's awesome, Jamie. Yeah, Thanks. we're excited for you. So I have something to share. Okay. Um, 
I experiments today with Educanon. And uh, it's like Canon, like boom Canon, by the way. And um, I really enjoyed it. And I'm going to tweet it out um, again so you can kind of test it out. But it was really easy to use. Um, you took any video that you can find, whether it's YouTube or Vimeo or not. You put it into your free account. And then as you watch the video, you click times where you want to insert either comments or like or questions. Um, and I really, really, really enjoyed it. And I did um, La Catrina, which is a typical, like a mid-1990s Spanish video for Spanish 3 students. Um, and I subjected my students to that today. <laughs> so nice. I know and it was really funny. They, did they do the, the questions and the comments? They did. Now here's what's oh, interesting. That's neat. Today I was not at school. <gasps> Yay! Oh. Yes. So I, um, I was able to conduct that virtually. And I was able to watch in, in real time all their scores kind of pop up and see who was doing their work and whatnot. I really loved it. So I'm going to so tweet funny. out um, the link for joining up as well as that video because you can have a public link for your video so other people can see it. So you can also you can watch La Catrina if you'd like and you can definitely laugh at the 1990s hair and um, <clears throat> then check out Educanon. I love them and I know there's other resources, other places that use a similar kind of setup, but this is very, very teacher friendly. Yeah, so. that's awesome. I you can do that um, for audio files on SoundCloud. Um, I know, which is not a student friendly necessarily site, but um, that's kind of one of the neat features of that. So it's nice to hear that there's a video option as well. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Do you have okay, a hot topic? So no, but it's so funny that you mentioned Educanon because I tried that out a couple of months ago. We actually taught it to our faculty, and we have these feast forms where teachers come and learn from one another, and so our media specialist and I did that, and my geometry teacher tried it, and he loved it. So awesome. I need to start being more vocal about hot topics because I always think the things I do aren't hot enough. <laughs> But yes, I they are. I could have shared that. Always. You're, you're right. It is so easy to use. And I love it because even if you're a Google Apps for Education school, your kids can sign in with their Google accounts. And nice. so um, it was very easy to set up for our students and our teachers. And like you said, the real time feature of it was amazing. And mm -hmm. just seeing what they got, you know, correct and incorrect um, was great. So, yay. Yeah, yeah. I forgot, totally forgot that. The, the, the ease of being able to sign in with your Google account is kind of important there. I love yeah. anything that you can just sign in with your Google Apps account these days. Yeah. I think that's just, yeah. it just makes the world of teaching so much easier. Extremely. You know? It does. So ladies, I'm going to sign off for a minute, but I'm going to jump back on before you guys get off because I left you my got girlfriend it. in there eating dinner. Well, have fun. Thank you for joining us. All right. Thanks. See you in a little bit. See ya. So <laughs> speaking of Google really quick, I have, I, I have an announcement. Ooh, I love your I'm Google announcements. I'm an Apple device girl, but I now am an owner of a Nexus. I was like, you know, I need to kind of give They're this a shot. They're best friends. They can be BFFs. Well, here's the thing. I mean, it goes nicely with glass, and I wanted to see, like, what was there. And I got a really good deal on it. You, you, can, um, <clears throat> do, you can do pings on Google search or the, the Google alerts. Whenever you get a really good price on a Nexus, you can go under the the store tab, the shop tab, and um, I got it for really, really cheap. I'm not gonna tell you how much, <laughs> but I got it for a good price, and um, I love it. It's been really, really interesting. So compared to Apple, I mean, there's a lot of things that are not device agnostic, which is mm -hmm. unfortunate, but um, mm -hmm. I like it. It's been a really interesting experience being multi-platform. Well, I have a little bit of a hot topic. A little mm -hmm. bit. Please do sharing. Oh. I'm asking. Well, so you guys know I've been gone for weeks and weeks and weeks. Have you been gone? Where have you been? You may have missed my smiling face. We did. Extremely we did. missed it. But we've been in Poland, and we've adopted two little boys. They are six and seven, and they came home with us on Saturday, and we're all super jet-lagged. So we've been up at 3.30 and 4.30, and... Now we're all sound asleep, <laughs> except for me. <laughs> oh, and we kept that edge of you secret so well. Oh my gosh, oh, Amy, she's just been. gone. It's been gosh, we left on Valentine's Day for our first trip, so it's been a long time. 
Oh my gosh, it has been a long time. Well, congratulations. That's Thank awesome. You. Yes, and they are so cute. I loved your little picture in front of your house. Mm -hmm. See, if you followed Amy on Instagram, you would see that. Yes, at Amy Alpine. Mm -hmm. mm. So congratulations. That is awesome. So now hey, you're um, sleep deprived. That's the hottest topic of all. <laughs> What's that? That's the hottest topic of all. It's a pretty hot topic. So that leads me into the fact that I have been... Um, evaluating many, many, many iPad apps. <laughs> and I have to, I'm sending out props to the iPad app developers who do not make your device have to have iOS 6 in order to run their um, app. Because I have two boys, one's on an older iPad and the other one's on the newer iPad. And well, you can see the problem it creates when one runs planes and the other one doesn't. Right. So, thank you to all the app developers that um, continue to support iOS 5. <laughs> Amy. Yeah. You know what? No, I, don't, I, 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 I don't think people are thinking about that. I really don't think that's a concept that people realize. That well, just like... I mean, for example, like if if you have like a first generation iPad, it's basically useless at this point. I was going to say that we're still using it. See, and but that's that that just makes me upset because how dare they go ahead and say no? We want you to buy new ones. Some people not, might not be able to. And so. for you know, families tend to give their kids their older devices, and that's what's happened here. Jack got an iPad when they first came out, and that's the one that our youngest is using, and then. Our oldest is using the grandfather's old, you know, iPad, but that happens to be an iPad too. So, you know, there's there's only a few apps that are like that, but you know, like the Stars in the Sky one, or you know, Planes. That was the the one that's really kind of thrown us all for a loop. Yeah, I realized it over the weekend when um, there was some uh -oh, app update. Maybe it was Google or something. Google asked, and my husband still has the first generation. Um, he has the worst device in the house. <laughs> Don't know how that happened, sorry. Um, and he said, Jamie, I can't, uh, I can't do anything with it. And I'm like, why? Just update the dang on thing. And he's like, no, Jamie, I can't update it. It doesn't allow updates. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> oh, okay. Sad. Yeah, I mean, but if you have an uh, iPhone, what is it, 3GS mm -hmm. or below, no, that won't do the updates anymore. So, yeah, I mean, those oh. are essentially... I mean, that's sad, but it's true. So what not to do in ed tech? Let's start with don't buy first-generation iPads <laughs> or iPods that are 3G or 3GS. That's the first thing that you do not do in ed tech. Yeah, keep keep your devices up to date. You yes. know what? That is a very, very good one. Very, very good one. Because I've, I've been in situations or in locations where it has been, <clears throat> let me just say a couple years ago, I had a Windows 95 experience. <gasps> Y'all, I, I can't, I just can't, like, I loved, the, I loved the school, and the leadership was great, and the faculty was great, but when I walked into the language lab, and I turned it on, and I saw Windows 95, I was, I didn't know what to do, I think I just took a picture and laughed about it, and then later on, I was kind of horrified. So. Kat, you will be shocked and amazed to hear that the computers in my lab still have some of those really, really old apps, like the 32-bit ones that you have to change the screen resolution for. Um, and there's one teacher who came in at the beginning of the year. She's like, oh, we just like to use this clock app. And I'm like, what? And I'm like, why won't my computers run it right? Yeah. Uh -huh. M-E-C-C. -C. Mech. Choo-choo-choo-choo-choo-choo-choo. Things across the screen. That's funny. Yeah, funny. So they all, all they do is play Oregon Trail. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, it's sort of along those lines. Um, but on that vein, when I came back to Georgia in 2007, this is a good laugh. When I left Georgia, I was an instructional technology specialist in Savannah in 2002. When I came back in 2007, I had to take the computer proficiency test for my certification because that makes sense. Because I hadn't taken in tech. Because, and Jamie, you might not know about InTech, but in 2001, 2002, when they were trying to get teachers in Georgia up to speed on technology, mm -hmm. everybody had to do this InTech course. Well, I was teaching the InTech course, so of course I didn't take it. When I came back to Georgia, they said, oh, well, you'll just have to take this computer proficiency test. 
okay, let me take your computer proficiency test. And it was on Windows 95 in 2007. And just for fun, I took the Mac one as well. And that was on um, Mac OS 9, which, you know, went out in 2000. So, uh, dear Georgia, please update your proficiency test if you've not done so since then. <laughs> I remember that test. <laughs> All right, guys. Crazy. Well, moving on with the, um, what not to do in ed tech. I'm sitting here with a post-it note. And I'm just like writing, 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 writing. And it's all just kind of coming back to me slowly. <laughs> funny story after funny story. And I think the first one we can talk about is people who use technology just for the sake of using technology. And that's probably one of the biggest, um, biggest mistakes that you can actually do in ed tech where you don't understand why you're going to use it, you don't have a background, you don't tie it to standards, it doesn't have a pedagogical method behind it, you're just like, hey look, here's a game, let's play it. <laughs> and that's about it. That's my biggest beef with Oregon Trail, by the way. So, um, you know, people will end up playing it, I don't know, in math for some reason, because dysentery and math go together so nicely. Wait a second, stop. <laughs> I do see the use for Oregon Trail in math because okay. you have to budget your money to get through the whole trail. And if you run out of money, then you die off from dysentery because you can't buy the medicine. <laughs> um, I can use. Did you know it was a Voxer chat that one day when she got started on Oregon Trail? You, did you miss I that know. one? Because Amy went a little crazy on Oregon Trail and a couple others. I can totally cross curricularize any <laughs> Oregon Trail. Well, but at least if you set it up beforehand, if you set it up to say, hey, we're in math, we're going to play Oregon Trail. Here's why, here's right. how I want you, yes. what I want you to do, and here's how I want you to prove it to me so I can assess it. Right. Because Oregon Trail doesn't have like a student account so you can view, you know, somewhere else. It's just a game. I'm sorry. It's a little too much for Oregon Trail apparently. But, you know, you have to assess it some way. You don't want it. You just, it's just not an excuse. Like Kia, I love Kia to pieces. It's great for assessment. And it also has some great games, but you can't just say, okay, kids, let's play games and not count on assessing how long they're doing whatever, you know, or picking whatever games you want them to play in particular in whatever order. You have to, you know, the constraint breeds, breeds creativity. You want to put some sort of standard, <clears throat> whether it's Common Core, you know, Common Core is not evil. Um, Thank you. You want to put something to it. Oh, that's coming. We're, we're, we're going to talk about that a little bit later, by the way. <laughs> Well, I think um, it goes back to what you both of you have said about TPAC. And if if you know anything about TPAC, you can't use tech for the sake of using tech. And right. what does TPAC stand for? Technology. Ooh, technology. Pedagogy. Pedagogy. Content. Content. Knowledge. <laughs> there you go. And we do that like Vanna White. I like how we can like, like dance around <laughs> while we're doing it. Yeah, and it, it's the intersection of the three. So if you have a Venn diagram, you know, you have the little circle, circle, circle. Right in the middle is where you want to be. So if you're using technology, you want to be there. Technological content knowledge. Very, very important. Yes. So, and I think that's probably one of my biggest mistakes that I see in ed tech. People just using it and saying, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to assess it. I'm not going to teach it in any way. It's just going to be whatever. And sometimes it doesn't really even tie into the content. I get that teachers burn out, but that is not why you should use technology to have rest time in between when you teach. No. No, and so one of my um, things that just crawls under my skin are the brain pop quizzes. Now, I love Tim and Moby. Oh, no. oh, I love Tim and Moby. I'm going to find my Moby picture in here somewhere. I have a Moby hat. I wear it around the classroom. Love Tim and Moby. Love their, their little movies. But teachers who bring all of their kids to the lab to take the brain pop quiz are just killing me. Now, Brain Pop Game Up has a lot of great, great interactive things, and you can set your whole class up on it, and I think that that's great. What just drives me crazy is every kid taking the same quiz and then printing it out in my lab. <gasps> no, not printing it out. That, printing out the results cool. every time. It's just like the person who makes the Google Doc and then prints out the Google Doc and hands it to their colleagues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Hey, we can't collaborate on it. You just draw on this piece of paper. <laughs> We're all together. Dandy. I know. 
Oh, all right. So anyway, but yeah, I have okay. introduced the game up and the the integration, the classroom integration to those teachers now. So I feel better about the whole brain pop yeah. quiz situation. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I taught with brain pop for years and loved their quizzes. I, I would ne I don't think I ever printed. I did print like a couple of their activities back in the day, but never did I print out a quiz. Um, and we used the quizzes more like like whole group like review like it was never I never gave that as a grade I know it was not like an, a real assessment it's like okay we just learned about molecular energy not that I taught molecular energy because I totally didn't but um, it was never it was never an end all be all assessment it's not meant to be an end all be all assessment Correct. assessment uh, we're going to do one of those shows aren't we oh yes we'll talk about that again <laughs> in a little bit yeah so <laughs> we'll just leave it right there it's not your end all be all assessment yeah Exactly. Well, we're on that. Well, that really didn't tie in. That was a horrible crossover. But, um, you know, I think uh, we actually chatted a little bit in Vox today about one of my probably biggest what not to do's. And I think it's, we've, we've kind of hit on this before, which is there's a huge difference between blogs and media posts and any kind of true data driven research. Now, you don't have to go into every day saying, I need to know the data research behind, you know, the Remind 101 I'm going to send today, you know. I mean, that's not necessary. But I think at some point there must be a balance between, oh, I read this great blog on XYZ. It must be the end-all, be-all. <laughs> um, there was, and I'm saying this because a friend of mine had said that parents in her district had come up on the Huffington Post um, article, the 10 reasons why you should never give kids under 12 a device. I saw that on Facebook. Yeah. Well, and um, in your district, I saw on Facebook Angie Forrester, who's an instructional technologist there in Fayette as well, she had um, posted this rebuttal from a, a teacher librarian who said, here's my 10 reasons why I'm going to make sure they're in my kids' hands. Um, of the two articles, the teacher librarians was far more in depth. She actually connected brain to research to hers, turns out. But what I think bugged me so much about that was that there's a group of parents that are going to go to teachers, right? And teachers who are already on this shaky, we're doing it, but we're not real sure about it kind of land. Mm -hmm. Then parents say, well, I just read this article about 12, 10 reasons why my kids shouldn't be using a device, and you're one to one. And the teachers, what do they do? It's just like, you know, what well, they back up, right? Well, we just can't do this. We're not going to fight parents. Right. And it's this, when did this one, and I think it was a, she's an occupational or some kind of occupational therapist. It was the, the author of this tape, this blog that Huffington Post did. Um, Huffington Post, and that's the thing, you have to understand what you're reading. Huffington Post's job is to put something out there that's going to spark discussion. Mm -hmm. Good, bad, or indifferent. It is not... Mm -hmm. They don't post something for the sheer enjoyment of it. They put it out there because they know it's going to create a reaction. That's what media does. Their intent is to spark some kind of emotion. And those are the kind of posts that indeed will spark some kind of emotion. So if you're going into it and the first blog you read is, you know, don't give technology to kids and that's the end of the world, there's a problem. That's a great one. Um, uh, Wanda, I think it's Terrell, I don't know, I'm afraid I'm saying her name wrong. Um, she had posted something on Facebook one day, and it was um, things parents need to know about Minecraft. And so I, you know, I commented on it, and I know Wanda, so you know, I knew she wasn't being like crazy or anything. Um, and I said, "Are you doing this like in? Are you doing like research on this for a class or whatever?" And she said that she was, um, she's thinking about applying to a doctoral program, and she was trying to get as, as much documentation on gamification and that sort of thing hmm. um, as she could compile because. She wanted to see both sides to be able to present, you know, um, her ideas and be able to stand behind what she felt and what she saw and what she believed. And I thought, what a great example. You know, she's posting blogs on, on all sides, but she sees all sides and she can collect all that. And to me, that's what you need to be doing. It doesn't, you don't have to immerse yourself in Google Scholar every day, but you can't take the first blog post that you read and assume that that's, that's one person's opinion. If you go and read my blog on Horace Mann today, you may agree with that, you may disagree with that, and that's okay. It's not anything statistical. I didn't run any data on that. I didn't do any case study on that. It's a blog, and, and I think it's really important to know the difference. I totally agree, and I mean that that translates to anything, really. I mean, because you're talking about blogging, what if you work with someone who's like, oh my gosh, 
I just try like like with the educated thing, right? It works for me. It might not work for you. But just because it works for me doesn't mean that it's going to work for you, you know? So you, you want to look around and shop around and research and make sure everything is, you know, everything is sound, that you're doing everything right. And it includes, you know, reading blog posts and assuming that that's like the gospel. <laughs> and I mean, there's a lot of good stuff out there. There is. There's a lot of really good stuff. But you have to, if you're going to go full force into something, You've got to you've got to compare a couple things. You've got to get one point of view and somebody else's point of view. And if you search and you can't find anything that negates something, then you're probably looking at something pretty good. Mm -hmm. But I think it's it's this. Oh, I've read a blog and Kat Flip and she she's the only one I'm ever going to listen to, right? <laughs> and so <laughs> that's the, if, if she's your end all be all and you never have any comparison to what she's mm -hmm. saying, now she's probably a pretty good one to listen to. Oh, thank you. But at the same token, it's you, I would never want someone to base their beliefs just on something that I wrote. Like that would be such an enormous pressure. I appreciate if you read what I write, but go find some of the resources. Well, and that's that's you know if you are if if you are reading a good blogger, mm -hmm. that person probably has a blog roll of other blogs they read and recommend, and links out a lot, not mm -hmm. just to their own blog posts, but also to other posts to other people who are writing about similar things. So that's how it's, it's a good hallmark of a good blog. So if you have a blog, put a so blog. Kat has just told me that my blog sucks. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm teasing. No, no, you're, you're amazing. Thank it's just, you. <laughs> it's just good practice, especially if it's a well-established blog. If you go and you read the blog and it's been there for several years, and you don't see any links out, that's kind of weird. Or if it only links to their own posts. That's kind of weird. You want somebody who is like, okay, you know, here's this perspective, well, here's this other perspective, or hey, I'm not the only one talking about this. Check out this, this, and this. So, generally, that's right. kind of I do happens. agree that those are good practices, Kat. I was just thinking, gosh, my blog is A, really plain, and B, I always link to who, the, what, the software I'm talking about, or, you know, something along those lines. Um, but I'm not really good about cross. Cross-linking, cross kind of, cross -linking. yeah. Cross-connecting. Well, and I, I understand that some people say that it's bad practice for getting people to read your content. For me, blogging is not about getting people to read my content necessarily. It's about sharing my expertise with whoever else wants to learn. Mm -hmm. I'm not out there to get followers. I'm out there to teach another demographic, essentially. So um, I link out frequently. I always link out. And I do have, you know, I'll have links to my own stuff if I repeat myself, but I'm not all about me, 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 me. Mm -hmm. I try to make my content to be as rich as possible and to be as, edu as educational as possible. Well, and Rick White on Twitter made a really good point because um, we're talking about, obviously, educators. But he says um, that some people always believe, obviously, what's posted um, and he's one of his main goals is making sure that his students walk away knowing how to be properly informed. Amen, and, Rick. Amen. Mm -hmm. And you know what really um, hampers that? Speaking of what not to do in EdTech, having What's horrible, that? horrible filters. Mm. <laughs> want, I mean, seriously, if you want to be able for your students to properly assess whether something is valid or not, if you're going to block everything, I mean, it's just like, you know, Raising kids, ra reading just Dr. Seuss until they're eleventh, until they're eleventh grade and twelfth grade, they go out to college and oh gosh, there's you know Ray Bradbury, there's all this like you know political reading and oh gosh Slaughterhouse Five, like you know they're not going to be exposed to that kind of stuff and it's going to be a huge shock and they're not going to know how to handle it. So, you know, having a giant filter at your school does not get that it is not very supportive of your f kids' future needs. And Stacia's said that before. She says, all we do is create little hackers. <laughs> if we block them from absolutely everything, they will find a way in, and we're not yeah. keeping them out. We're just creating little hackers. Which is an interesting skill into itself, but only when yes. in a positive, positive environment. Right. Right. Absolutely. One of the best analogies I heard, um, I think, was from Will Richardson, whose blog is maybe willrichardson.com. But I always find his point of view interesting, even if I don't agree with it. It's well thought out and um, provocative at times. 
But he said something along the lines of, you know, having these filters is like, or not having filters is like, you know, letting your kids go to the bus stop by themselves. That you're not always going to like what they see at the bus stop, but they need to see it and learn how to deal with it. It's like everyday life. That was really poorly worded, but that's the general gist of what he said one time. So, no, I think that's very nicely worded. I mean, you, you, well, I understand. I mean, you just, I'm trying to repeat and remember exactly what he said, but well, I mean, we we do live in a time where parents are especially very protective of their students, and I guess that kind of feeds over into school. But it's almost to a fault. You really don't want to be overly protective, and that that applies to some technology. Some some teachers will be too afraid to use technology because they think that it's going to be oh, it's just too much. Oh, they can't collaborate online. You know, mm -hmm. something bad might happen. So what? Something bad will, might happen. You know what? It happened to me, but I'm still here and I'm still using things. I'm not like horribly scarred for life. And those kids actually had a really good lesson from whatever happened. And I, I, I'll get into it one day about what happened. <laughs> but still, it was a good lesson for me. It was a good lesson for them afterwards. So we learned. We moved on. It's mm -hmm. not the end of the world if you lose control or it's not the end of the world if somebody messes up. Sure. You know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, and this is maybe even the different perspective between high school and elementary school. We had some students see some inappropriate content this past week, and I don't know. I don't know all the details. I just got an email about it today, but um, and I don't know if it was on the Wi-Fi or if it was on the on the computers in the classroom. I think it was on the computers in the classroom, and they have a different security for whatever reason. Um, but we've just introduced, you know, BYOT into our fourth grade. And so then, you know, if the kids are accessing inappropriate content just on the computers that are already in the classroom, that really sets up a big wall for the teachers. And so I think that some of the stricter measures are, you know, security filters are actually needed in elementary school, even though I cannot believe that those words just came out of my mouth. No, I get it. You, you want to scaffold it. And we're actually about to talk about scaffolding, ironically. But you want to scaffold, you know, maybe you want to scaffold security. And there is a way to do that. And if you're a Gaffey school, I mean, and not to plug any more companies, but let me tell you, Securely is a solution to that problem. So if you don't know what Securely is, it's, it's spelled S-E curly, not secure. Not, there's not an E at the end for some reason. Um, and you're able to, as a classroom teacher, let's say you have your students come in, right? Mm -hmm. You can filter and regulate just that class, just for that class period. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you just want to block everything, you can block everything and have one test open. Or if you want to actually allow the kids to search and have something open, you can actually unblock things. Yeah. So that, that flexibility across levels and across classrooms is exactly what we need. So props to them for taking that step forward. Yeah, that's that's really interesting, Kat, and I was trying to envision how that would work. I know, and you're gonna have some <laughs> teachers who abuse it, but then that kind of comes to. And that wasn't even that wasn't right. even the part that I was thinking about. I was just thinking about the teachers um, being adept and thoughtful enough ahead of time to say, oh, you know, this is the level of filtration I want at this particular point in time for this particular lesson and then taking the time to do that. I see that as an obstacle for them. Although I think it's a it's a great solution. Well, and I think, Amy, I'll let you get to your, I know you really want to talk about what you just talked about there. Um, but that comes down to being prepared. Here's something else about ed tech that bothers me. Teachers will walk into a room and say, you know what, let's just do this. When it comes to technology, you have to be prepared. Someone once told me, failing to plan is planning to fail. Mm -hmm. And that is so true when it comes to technology. If you walk in there and you don't know what you're doing, or the students aren't even prepared, you want to have your classroom prepped and ready. And you want to say a couple of days before, hey, we're going to be doing this. Let's get ready to do this. Hey, you know, the day before, tomorrow, come make sure you come and bring your technology or your device of some sort because we're doing this. And then with the day of, you need to be prepared backwards and forwards for failure, for winning, for anything. Mm -hmm. You have to be prepared and plan well ahead. And that way, your students feel secure because especially if you're introducing something for the first time, they might not be, you know, just because they're native doesn't mean they're, they're literate. They're not going to know how to 
use the material right off the bat. You know, when I first introduced Socrative, it was like it was like a bomb went off in my classroom. The kids did not understand how how that worked, and it took me it took a while to get them used to it. And that's also something else. You never want to do a one and done. Mm -hmm. Don't ever be like, okay, class, we're going to do this, and you never do it again. That is not how you want to approach educational technology. I just ran through a bunch of like four different things not to do. I apologize. <laughs> You got pretty intense there. I wasn't gonna stop it. I know. I feel very strongly about this topic. <laughs> but Jamie, but, you were about to say. Yeah, and, and it all feeds into how we can solve some of these problems, Jamie. Well, you know, I think uh, one of my user friends had told me that um, a question that's circulating, you know, in their staff meetings is, "What professional learning are you going to do this summer?" And that sounds like a really great question. Like, if I haven't asked that, I'm like, "Oh my gosh, I can't even wait to tell you what I'm going to do this summer." But let's think of it realistically. Can you, I mean, Amy, I want you to imagine throwing to your staff this question. We're going to need you to list the professional learning you're going to do for the summer. They're going to go, what's the district offering? Right? <laughs> <laughs> what's the district offering? Yeah. I will take that, that, and that. That, I will, no, I'm on vacation that week. What can I work in this week? Because I'm not How on vacation. How many PLO, week, right? PLUs do I need for my recertification? Uh -huh. And what will fit into the weeks I'm not on vacation? Oh, well, I don't really need that, but that that's the only time I'm free. So right. Mm -hmm. So it's that we have created this whole mainstream idea of we're going to provide a calendar of events, and do you find a few days that work for you, whether or not it actually applies to you whatsoever. We're going to need you to be in here three times, five times, how many ever times this summer, for so many hours, to get so many PLUs. Ten, um, ten hours, Jamie. Ten, ten hours. hours. One, one PLU. Ten hours. Commit to something. And you're like, okay, well, whatever, right? So we, this one size fits all professional learning plan rolls out. We all come and sit. We get. We walk out. We're done. We get our PLU, right, Amy? Yay for PLU. <laughs> Or we get nothing from that. We get a P. That's what you get. Uh, congratulations, you have a PLU. <laughs> that is all you have accomplished in this one. Wait, 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 stop. You might have a folder full of paper. You might. <laughs> you might. Okay, so so that's true. true. Score two. But what are you carrying out from that? You have to say, what am I going to do in the fall? What do I plan to do? I plan on using um, some type of LMS, School G or Edmodo, my big campus. I'm going to use, I probably need to find that. It may not be offered by your school district. Guess what? It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. Find what you care about and run with it. If you want to gamify your PD, send a little uh, tweet to Kath Lippin and say, where am I going to find some good resources? I'd like to do some gamification in my classroom with some kids next year. Chances are your district might not be offering that as professional learning. If you are going into professional but learning... Stop, Jamie. I'm not going to do it if there's not a PLU involved. <laughs> I need to put that payment of a PLU. Okay. Well, we re need to revisit the idea of the PLU. and That's what not that's what to do in EdTech. Let's revisit the idea of the PLU. But, I mean, that's the idea. And I, I know they need it. I get that they need it. Um, I'm I, sorry. I, I don't understand. I have way too many PLUs. How is it? That some people are That's because you're in a degree program. You're in a doctorate program. <laughs> you're in a degree program, girl. We're yeah, solid for cool. like the next five there, years. There are tons of opportunities. There are ways to get this done, and it just doesn't seem even not. Like, yeah. GAETC -E conferences, conferences. I mean, like you, you can actually work with your school to develop. Like our, when I worked at Mill Creek, they made it so department meetings were PLUs because mm -hmm. that is extra time that you're, you know, you're you're developing yourself in a meeting. Our staff meetings are, we have a PLU for our staff meetings um, because I do professional learning at all of our staff meetings. Yeah, you know exactly. I mean? Yeah, there are ways to get, get to get past that. PLUs are not an excuse, people. Yeah. You've got to find what works for you and, and if you are only doing what is offered, mm -hmm. um, you are saying, you are essentially saying, I'm going to follow the leader. <laughs> and just do whatever, and you're not going to change your practices. Nothing will change. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've I, ever gone into my classroom and done anything different based on a one-size-fits-all, you-have-to-attend-this-session kind of thing. No, mm -hmm. not, not a you-have-to-attend, because that's when I get punchy and make notes and <laughs> draw pictures, mm -hmm. and uh, one-size PLU and Amy Pachowski don't get along. 
Mm-hmm. I'm a ha- I, I would I would love to see scaffolded professional learning, where so you have a choice. Oh, sorry. No, it's fine. Go ahead. No, go scaffolded. No, I was just, I'm just dreaming about scaffolded professional <laughs> learning in public school. Like it's just they don't. Nobody ever thinks about it. Like what about people like us who are like hyper users? You know, I don't want to go to a uh, how to email e- e- meeting because those actually do exist. And I understand some people need the how to email meetings. But I don't, so you're going to have me sitting there and not really develop my time. And granted, some teachers might like that because they get to do other things like grade. But we'll, oh man, this is like opening a can of worms. Amy, continue. So, I'm going to stop you right there. Can closed. Um, and tell you here's what not to do <laughs> in EdTech. Do not respond to an email that starts like this. Oh no. Hi there. This is the email I got today. Hi there. State assessment tests are coming up soon. <laughs> Would you like to have a quick call about an effective tool that can help your students get ready? No. Don't respond to that email. Do not <laughs> respond. Wait, I, a phone I, I, call? I, yeah. <laughs> Would you like to have a quick Who call? Who is calling you to talk about state assessment? Who has... It's, it's a company, so I'm going to look it up real quick before I call okay. them out. But it, It's like a group phone call. And they're emailing. Because you want to spend your time talking about state assessments. Because that, that's the joy of EdTech. I'm, just, okay. I'm, I'm stuck at the whole, you emailed to get a phone call. I'm so there. the company, oh, wait, where did it go? Go back to the Google search. Because it has, it's like, this company is a K-12 reading intervention program that helps ELL, ESOL, Title I students close the achievement gap with culturally relevant content. Oh my god. Okay, and days before the assessment, their phone call is going to do what? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Give you a little pep talk? Rah, rah. Seriously. Well, here's my thing. What is their definition of culturally relevant? I don't know. Would you like me to read their blog? <laughs> no, no. I, I'm just, no. I'm, I'm afraid that you might that, that. Please no. revert, revert back to do not take every call to the gospel. <laughs> oh, oh. But they have new administrative tools for teachers. Mm. They do have blended learning. Mm. I got another one. Do not just buy into any company that offers professional learning. Extra Amen. professional learning. No, that is Anybody so Anybody can slap that on there. I can... Welcome to the edge of you, professional learning. Hey, right. No, 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 blended learning. Blended learning, Jamie. Oh, hey, good. Well, there's where I should be. PLUs. Probably. We could offer. We should offer PLUs for watching interview. Can we do that? I can guarantee you people get more out of this than some of those crazy sessions they have to sit in. You know, hey, it's, it's I, I you know, I might talk to somebody in my district about that because <laughs> I think that's an amazing idea that they um, have a two-way conversation with us Monday nights on a Google Hangout. That you know they're tweeting to us and we're tweeting back. And we know that those people, like our good friend Sharon Mitchell, who works right here in this county and is an avid listener. She is. She doesn't need PLUs either. She's hanging in there in that same degree program as me. <laughs> We're hanging in there together. Uh, okay, so you know what? The people who have the PLUs are the people who are continuously here. learning. Yeah. Probably. That's it. Um, yeah. If so. you need a PLU and you would like Amy to work on this for you, <laughs> Contact. I didn't feel that. Yeah. Yes. I, maybe I'll just contact the Georgia Department of Education and I'm like, say, hey, yeah. oh, I've done that. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. work. You've got to fill out a lot of stuff. I challenge you. I challenge you to this. I really want you to see if you could get this done because I'm curious, as someone who who wants to do a tweet chat one day, you can have a public school tweet chat. I would love to have a PLU associated with that. So they'd have to watch, what, 10 shows? <laughs> Well, no, I mean, like, it, it's, but, oh, come on, you have a tweet chat, you have a show every week. That's, like, done. What if we were the first ever online show to get a PLU for us? That would right. be awesome. Let's do it. I'm can, just, run before somebody else gives the idea. We just I don't that know, it's, but it's not a new idea. <laughs> because we used to go, okay, so when I was first uh, in, like, my first year out of college, my principal signed me up for this. It was from Annenberg. It was, so it was PBS-based, um, you know, I, 
that I had to go and watch. I had to go to, to a school that had the particular equipment for the teleconference. We had to oh watch God. the video, stop the video at certain points, submit our questions via conference call. But that was in 1997, friends. It's not yeah. a new concept. We just have this really cool way of doing it. Now. Way of doing it. Yeah. Well, girls, we have whipped through, um, it's 9.30, and we've whipped through some of, we've just hit the surface, I think, of what not to do, but I think we've yes. some good stuff. I know. I have one more thing I have to say. Add it in, girl. Because it leads into some of the things we're going to be talking about in the month of April. Yeah. Not assessing effectiveness of the technology that you use in your classroom is a huge mistake, mistake in ed tech. If you use something and you use it over and over and over again, but you can't tell me how you know that it actually works, then why are you using it in the first place? Because everything is about the student. And if it's not working for the students, it should not be working for you. Sorry, I had to end on a very serious note. Very, very yeah. serious, but very, very... Exactly, and it ties in very nicely to things we're doing in April. So, let me talk really quick about April plans. Um, What's well, coming April, up in April, Kat? Well, April 7th, we don't have a show. It's spring no. break. Spring break! <laughs> Amy, that's me and you, friend. Yeah. Hey, but I have been on spring break all spring. Yeah, they need to on spring break for like two months. Okay, well, for those of us who haven't, Next week is uh, this part of town's spring break. So. Mm -hmm. But we highly recommend, we recently reposted an unseen show that we that was not really widely watched from season one where we talked with Jerry Blumengarten, Cyber Man. So go on our YouTube channel and take a peek. We're actually going to publish it as well as a podcast for that week. So um, you'll be able to listen, and it's like we're kind of sort of there, but not really. Fine. So, and so then, what are we doing after that, Kat? Well, we have the whole month of April planned out, Jamie, so let me oh, tell you. Oh, cool. I can't um, wait to hear. I know. On the 14th, we are talking Going Google, Why and How, with EdTech Chick. Yay, Jessica Johnson. Jessica Johnson. Texas in the room. Another I'm Texan. We're just surrounded by Texans. We love the Texans. It has and nothing then, to do with the fact that I was there for six years. We're just going to pretend that didn't happen. Okay. <laughs> on the 21st, we're going to talk about Assessment. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Where's the sound effect for that one? Well, I don't have a Google effects that. Right after CRCT ends? Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, think, I, I think we timed that very nicely on purpose. <laughs> Especially following, I think there's a bunch of places doing the uh, park kind of, um, what is it, preliminary, preliminary assessments park? Not um, in Georgia. Not Georgia, not Georgia, but other schools are. So we'll probably pull in. Uh, we're probably going to bring Rodney in, hopefully, because um, he's he recently just did that. So it'd be nice to have that perspective. But yeah, we are going to talk about assessment, not just in a negative context. I don't want it to be just a down with standardized assessments. I want it to also be talking about There's the good side of assessments. So we'll talk about you know the angel and the devil of the assessments, <laughs> and then we're going to end the month of April. On another very, very scary note, <laughs> but on a positive turn of it, we're going to talk about how Common Core is not evil. Thank you. Thank, yeah, and we're bringing in a local educator. Her name is Lindsay Briard. She's um, on Twitter at L. Briard, um, and she is a high school English instructor. She teaches 10th and uh, AP, and she's done pre-AP. She's done 9th. She's done them all. Um, at various schools, one that was almost a, that was a Title I school, and now she's at a different school. But she's used Common Core effectively, and she loves it. And she embeds it with project-based learning. The things that she or she's doing is amazing, and she can do it. If she can do it, other people can too. So she's going to come talk about why Common Core is actually a good thing. So, and we are purposely starting with we're, we're, we're stacking them on purpose. We're doing assessment first, following with Common Core for a reason, and you'll find out why. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, cat. You tease us so. Yes. I know. April is going to be a fun month, and then hopefully we are continuing through May and June, and we might have some very, very amazing guests, which I'm not going to tell you about just yet. No, that's a great. All right, girls. Well, we'll be back in two weeks, and we'll be, uh, we'll be excited. So you all have a good little break. I know Kat's not really breaking it, but in there I'll be breaking it. So we will see you all in two weeks. Definitely. And... Um, Thanks for joining us, and always please continue the conversation. 
you will be able to watch the show soon on EdReach on our EdReach channel and on our YouTube channel. Also, might as well go ahead and say we are going to have a web page as well. Edgeview.org will be going live within the week. Uh, and you can also see our show on there and also subscribe to us on podcasts. We are everywhere. Everywhere. And uh, don't forget also to follow us on Twitter because we will be tweeting out all this information about our upcoming shows at EdgeView. So I guess two weeks, Monday, 845. With Jessica Johnson. See you guys then. See you then. Good night, y'all. Good night.